Hello everyone. This is Steve Connor, the director of Central Hampshire Veterans Services. Uh, this is our second episode, uh, our first one last month. We were talking about what my office does and the second part was talking to the commander of the VFW and the president of the Veterans Council of Northampton. So it was more specific about Northampton itself uh, and our attempt to go to the wall in Washington, D.C. That is still going forward. However, because we didn't get enough people to commit at this point, we've moved that trip until Vietnam Veterans Day next March. Um, but there'll be money, plenty of time to talk about that. Today I'm going to talk again about our benefits in our program, but I also have a guest uh, for the second part of the show, um, and we're going to have a conversation that's a pretty hot topic right now, um, and that is the proposed closing of the VA hospital up in Leeds, and also um, speaking on the Hoyoke Soldiers Home as well, just kind of an update on that, uh, with my good friend John Parody who um, I'm on the coalition for the Hoyoke Soldiers Home with, and of course he formerly worked for the VA, so um, he and I still collaborate and deal with the issues that go on up there as well. But first I just wanted to remind everybody about our program. So again, Central Hampshire Veterans Services includes the towns from Pelham all the way out to Middlefield. Let me see if I can do this really quick. We have Pelham, Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, Williamsburg, Goshen, Cummington, Chesterfield, Worthington, Middlefield, and Chester. I think I got them all. And what do we do? Well, we help the veterans and their dependents or their surviving family members um, for, the, for all the things that veterans can receive here in Massachusetts and through the federal government i.e. the VA and entities like that. So again, we help with paperwork for veterans to apply for VA healthcare, for VA benefits if they have a service-connected disability, or in some cases, if a veteran is now disabled, older, but is not due to their service, the VA has other programs under their pension program. One of the biggest ones we're called on for that it's called the Aid and Attendance Program when somebody needs support in the home or they need to move to assisted living. That's our job. That's one part of our job. The other part of our job um, is the ceremonial and all of the other issues, parades, things like that that happen around the district. And primarily, we run a benefits program. The benefits program is under Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 115. What does that program do? It helps veterans and their families or surviving spouses or surviving family members with assistance. Way back in 1861, Massachusetts passed a law and it was under the, the support of Abraham Lincoln who had said, our, at that time our president, who had said that he had borne the battle that we were going to serve them. Well, Massachusetts took that to heart they passed a law that said every city and town is going to have somebody designated to that role. Well, that's what my role and the rest of my staff in the office. Last month we had Robert on the show. He's new. Uh, Rebecca and Jessica. We all work for all those towns making sure that veterans get what they need. What do I mean by what they need? Well, pretty simply it is if you're struggling financially and you're a Massachusetts veteran or the family member, surviving family member of a Massachusetts veteran, we're here to look at your circumstances and potentially help you out financially. It's a benefits program that is by law designed by the state of Massachusetts, but the money comes from the different cities and towns that you live in. We help you out. If it's short term or long term, we're there to help you financially stay on your feet, make sure you don't end up homeless, that you, you have the medications that you need, you're able to go to your appointments. And we do that for anyone who is struggling, especially those that are retired or disabled on fixed incomes. That's a big part of it. So if you are collecting a monthly government check 
and because you're on disability and you are unable to work and you have limited resources in other areas as a matter of fact if you're the easiest way to look at it is if you're 200 percent of the federal poverty level or below we are your source for assistance depending on what you have in savings you know if you have a lot of liquid assets no but if you're struggling that's what we're here for so i want to make sure that everyone knows it that you tell every other veteran that you know or their family members that we are here and that's our goal is we don't want any veteran or their family struggling desperately to get by whether it's clothing whether it's rent whether it's medications whether it's getting to appointments we are here to make sure that that works for you there are some qualifying components to it what i would say is you do have to be a Massachusetts veteran who served active duty um, for at least 90 days during wartime or 180 days during peacetime. I myself am a, am a peacetime veteran. I served after the uh, Vietnam war, war was over and um, before 1990 when we then now started a new wartime period. So for those that 15 years, if you served, lots of times you're either called a peacetime veteran or a Cold War veteran. Um, but that's when I served. So you have to have done 180 days. But if you did and you live in Massachusetts or the veteran who is now deceased lived in Massachusetts and you live in Massachusetts, we are here to help you. It doesn't exist anywhere else in the country. Uh, it's just a Massachusetts program. But all you have to do is give our office a call. I'll give you the number. It's 413-587-1299. And make inquiries with our staff. Um, or just come on in, make an appointment, and come and see me. Maybe you're just, there's a whole lot of questions, and it's complicated, and you don't know if you'd be eligible. Ask us. Set up a time. Rob or I or Rebecca, we will sit down with you and we will tell you all the things that we have to offer. We don't want people suffering and for goodness sakes, we don't want anybody outside. We don't want anybody who, has, who doesn't have shelter, or doesn't have a safe place to live. Um, the National Program to End Veterans Homelessness st started back in 2009 and since then they have cut the homeless veteran population in half nationwide. We have done a great job here in the Pioneer Valley and in my district. Um, we have very, very few people who are outside or even in shelter. The numbers even at the Soldier On program have gone down um, because we look at it as a housing first model and we are gonna get people housed and then we bring services to them so that they can stay where they are. That's done through either the VA with their social work program and their homeless program, or it's done locally with me to make sure that you're always able to pay your rent and you can stay up on things and make sure your bills are paid. That's what we do because we want you in a house, we want you safe. So I wanna just reiterate one more time. Also, if you are a veteran who is out of work and you've run out of unemployment and you're still tr struggling to get full-time employment, we can supplement your income to make sure that you can stay on your feet until something else comes along or if you are filing for disability we can assist you until that disability comes through. Many people who apply for SSDI um, get very frustrated because they put it in and in three months they get a letter that says you've been denied and they think wow they didn't even really look at my stuff or why did they say that and they get mad what I can tell you is, is don't get mad over it. The way the law is written, if you apply for disability, they have 90 days to give you an answer. They have no choice, but they're overwhelmed and they can't go through all the files in time. So if they just never even opened your file, they're gonna send you a denial because they have to by law. Always appeal it, always appeal it. And you don't need a lawyer right away either uh, if it's just, if it's very apparent. We can help with that with both Social Security Disability and with the VA and the pension program. So there's help out there for you. That's why we exist. That's why they pay me the big bucks. 
or not. Um, and we're here to help you. So please uh, feel free to give our office a call. Our main office is in Northampton, but we have office hours in Amherst, Hadley. We will go to any of our towns. You just call up, we'll go up there. I was just up in Cummington a couple weeks ago to see two veterans. One of those veterans wanted to see me about the topic that we're gonna bring up right after this break, and that is about the VA hospital. And he was very concerned because he relies on it. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute, but again, Feel free to call our office if you want any help. I would greatly appreciate it. We're gonna take a quick break and I'm gonna bring my uh, guest in um, to talk about both the VA and the potential closing and also uh, some talk about the Hoyoke Soldiers Home. Thank you. Welcome back everyone, thanks. Thanks for sticking around. Um, I now wanted to bring into a, um, my guest for today's show is a friend. Um, we became friends in the veteran world. Um, retired Lieutenant Colonel John Paradis. I heard for a good dozen years everybody calling him Paradis or Paradise. <laughs> it is Paradis. Um, I have half of my family was French. I know which one <laughs> letters you're not supposed to pronounce. And uh, so I know it's Paradis. Um, and, and we're just going to have a conversation about, primarily we're going to talk about the VA closing, but we're also going to talk a little bit about the Hoyoke Soldiers Home as we are both members of the Hoyoke Soldiers Home Coalition. And it's, um, we've just passed the two year mark uh, anniversary of that tragic, tragic month of COVID infection and mm -hmm. loss of life. And it was, uh, incredibly painful for anybody who knew anybody up there who worked up there I mean it just uh, I don't even want to start with that yet right now I wanted to talk with John John welcome hey Steve hi how's it going it's going well it's going and well and you're supposed to be in retirement and we keep dragging <laughs> you back out of retirement okay. in the veteran you know, world we, we we always uh, tell veterans you know uh, you continue to serve after you put the uniform away you know you yeah stay active. and even the career you That's know right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so um yeah j just it, it's weird i was on vacation and i remember getting a report that oh, i think you sent an email and i i was out of the country and i read the email that you know um our legislation for the hoyoke soldiers home that we've been trying to get our input in for a year now mm was going into um, what Massachusetts does, which is a conference committee, because the House had a very different version than the Senate. That means they had to decide on how they were gonna make it one bill, and then have it come out, voted on, if it passes, go on to the governor. Um, but I was like, all right, well, we've done pretty much what we need to do. We've been advocating for this stuff for how many Zoom meetings were we on? How many times did we right. talk to politicians across the state? Uh, and the leadership and the administration about what we saw needed. So I was like, wow, that's great. You know, come back. I'll be relaxed. Won't have that stress. <laughs> that was on a Wednesday. Um, I was coming up from South America. So I got back on a Wednesday afternoon. Thursday, went back to the office, really slow motion. And then Friday morning at about six o'clock, my phone just started going beep, beep, bing, bing. And I was like, what in God's name is going on? And I pick up the phone and it's conversations that people are having about an article that was on Mass Live about the closure of the Leeds campus of the Lee, uh, VA Medical Center up in Leeds and that it was being recommended to be closed. And I started reading it and reading it and stuff was still flying through and I was like, oh boy, the fight has, is not over yet. <laughs> it's just changed. And I was like, all right, well we had a day and a half off. So here we go. <laughs> just so people understand it, if you can help us understand exactly how did we get here how did how did we get to where they made that announcement and of course that announcement was kind of a leak and then on that um 
following Monday, the um, VA secretary actually talked about it, or the whole release of their recommendations going to the commission uh, sure. came out. Sure. Yeah. See. Yeah. I, and I think you're you're right. I think it it caught many of us by surprise, um, knowing uh, our familiarity with all the programs and the services at the Northampton campus that you know, you use VA, I use VA, right, and have come to know. Uh, the staff there so um, you're right you know on the heels of um, where we were at the legislation for the soldiers home in Holyoke which still continues right um, it, it caught it caught us by surprise I think and um, the news um, while it's a long process and we can talk about that um, you know it, it did seem a little bit um, it was disheartening frankly mm -hmm. um, considering the amount of work um, that's been done at VA right, in Leeds. Right. Plus and I think that's every, everything that everybody's been so confused about. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So I guess, you know, um, to kind of for the audience to give some context to this. Um, so for some years now, there's been a lot of discussion about um, retention of assets, infrastructures at various VA medical centers across the country, and certainly everything within the federal government, there's always gonna be conversations and discussions about the budget, right? Right, right. So, um, certainly going back to uh, easily now, who, 10 years ago now, there's been this kind of this dialogue conversation in Washington about um, how to best manage care uh, for veterans in our country and um, a realization on the VA's part that um, they they can't possibly budget-wise cover every possible contingency from A to Z for everything that a veteran possibly needs for their well-being. You know, and the VA is the largest integrated healthcare system in the country, one of the largest systems in the world, and right. is the second largest uh, department in the federal government. It's massive in scale. I think it employs more you know, healthcare providers and any any entity in right. our nation. So it's massive. Um, so when you look at every program, and you mentioned some of the programs in your in your discussion about the, the Chapter 115 benefits from your office, you know, when you're talking about um, homelessness, when you're talking about uh, various levels of treatment, whether it's primary care to highly specialized care for veterans that have very chronic acute needs, it can get very expensive. So looking at efficiencies, again, going back many years, the discussion has come up about, well, can veterans get their care in the community and perhaps get as good care in the community and perhaps more efficiently for the federal government? Right. And so that dialogue discussion has come up um, from time to time. and. Yeah. It resulted ultimately in legislation passed in 2014, as you know, the, the Choice Act, right. the Choice Program that allowed us as veterans that are enrolled in VA healthcare some options to use care in the community. Um, as you know, Steve, and we lived through that period where, you know, there are a lot of growing pains. In fact, I think the first couple of years, I think by and large, the reviews were very, very poor. Right. Um, providers weren't getting paid. Uh, veterans that were asked to to use community care had wait times that you know far exceeded what whatever standards the VA had had set right. set about when they created the legislation. Right. And so you know a lot of internal investigations. There were whistleblowers at various VA medical centers. One very prominently out in the Phoenix area in Arizona. We were talking about all different kind of like pencil whipping. Mm -hmm. at the VA level where they weren't being accurate with access and wait times and things like that. So ultimately, um, and, and during that period, there became more discussion about, well, listen, I mean, the VA can't get this right. So perhaps maybe we should start looking more towards another model of care that would include more outsourcing and privatization than it would be actual care at a VA medical center. But, you know, and, and, and just for a quick note on that is, is you know, legislation was passed, and they said, all right, VA, do this. And it was something that they had to make up as they went. Like, they never did that before. So they come up with a choice program. 
growing pains for sure, but I think part of it was is nobody was given enough time to get ready to run a program like that. And so, of right. course, it was a jumbled mess. I remember trying to get some of my services right. through that program, and it was... <laughs> right, it was I mean, you could say free. that they were set up for failure. Yeah. And, it seemed you know, like quite it. honestly, there's, there's people inside government that say perhaps that was part of, 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 of what's happening, right. what you're seeing now. Right. Um, so, a lot of behind the scenes, and this has been borne out in uh, several media reports, uh, some very thoughtful enterprise reporting uh, by likes of the New York Times, among others. Um, Secretary Shulkin, who uh, you know, went to Hampshire College, knows right. this area right. well, <clears throat> became the VA secretary under President Obama, then continued with President Trump, and uh, ultimately, in 2018, they passed the, the Mission Act, which right. had, had bipartisan support. Right. That was intended to fix many of the issues with the CHOICE program and to give us as veterans further options for care. Right. Um, but all under the umbrella of that it's going to be a collaboration between VA medical centers, um, uh, private sector care, and uh, what they call strategic collaboration. Strategic co collaboration meaning academic affiliates and, right. and others, you know, which here in New England, we, right. we, have, a, we have a lot of resources there. Yeah, yeah go back to, you know, of when um, Secretary, Secretary McDonald, McDonald right, was right. there and we went to a thing and I went to a presentation. How much research is done in the VA with other medical institutions, but the amount of research, it's almost like it's the medical equivalent of NASA when it came to you know science and, and they would discover stuff for NASA and they say, oh, and then there's a practical use for it. Same yeah. thing with the VA yeah. and their research. I had no idea how the much VA, it The VA, I, I mean, I worked in the VA and I was right. an outreach coordinator for the VA so I know the VA extremely well, plus I get all my care through the VA. Right, right. And um, I've had family members that have used the VA. Um, I believe the VA system is great. Is it mm -hmm. perfect? No. No healthcare system, nothing is perfect. Right. But by and large, the VA is a, ex is a, a, a extremely, um, well, it's veteran-centric. Right. You know, that, and that, I think that's, that's what we're concerned about as we look at what perhaps is being forecasted up to including the closure of the VA Medical Center in Leeds, just a few miles from where we are today. Right. Um, so they passed this 2018 Mission Act, and it was to give, again, some more options, but to really start working on kind of like, you know, this, this three-legged stool for the VA. You, you could either, a, as a veteran, you could go to the VA Medical Center nearest to you and get your yeah. primary care and get specialty care if it's available, if it's not available, or if the conversation that you have with your provider, your primary care doctor, the specialty care provider that you're working with, and they say, probably it'd be better for you to use this doctor on the outside, and there's mm -hmm. that agreement, yep. then you can use the outside. And then the third part is, well, there may be services that um, uh, would, be, would be better for you to use a strategic collaboration, i.e. an academic affiliate, and we'll shift your care over to that provider. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was 2018, and um, as this new administration was starting, that law that was passed in 2018 said that you will create a commission. Right. And the, the commission will look at how do you take that mission act and how do you actually Im implement it and employ it, you know, to have, have the best care for veterans in our country. And... Um, it starts with VA recommendations. So the VA recommendations across the entire country, um, as Steve and I, this is the world that we live in, right. the VA is split into regions of called, you know, Veteran Integrated Service Networks. It's the It took the me a while vision. to remember that one, but <laughs> yes. So for, and we're Vision 1. So for all we're the veterans <laughs> out there, it's much like a major command in your yeah. service, you know. Right. Uh, Army has a major command, the Air Force, they all have the fleet in the Navy. Right. All. So the, the visions are what really do the work day to day in overseeing and managing the care in the region. So, and, and, and in that way also, it, and I don't know if it was designed this way, maybe it 
It, well, it works this way where, okay, I can't get, all right, I needed to get my knee operated on. Leeds doesn't have anybody who operates. So I either could have gone out and seen somebody in orthopedic or I could go to a different VA and I ended up choosing the one up in White River Junction. They said, you can go down, there's a guy down in West Haven, Jamaica Plain or White River Junction. Right. And I picked White R River Junction and they were like, why, why would you do that? You know, it's so far away. And I'm like, have you ever driven down to West Haven, Connecticut? <laughs> Do you ever drive into Boston in the beginning of a day? Yes. yes. Yeah. So it might be further away, but it's this nice, gentle drive. So that, but if if one hospital doesn't have it, there's probably somebody else within the vision that's going to be able to. Yeah, that's meet a good that example. Need. And yeah. the, you know, I guess to carry that forward, um, and and. I mean, knees and, and the physical kind of conditions that we as veterans over time have disabilities for. Right. The VA is extremely good at that. I mean, right. that's that's kind of the their 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 core business model is working towards those physical uh, physical ailments. But there are a whole host of things for healthcare that mm. veterans need help with. Yep. And so the VA says, okay, well, maybe like your example with the knees, maybe there's some other procedure that you need that, you know, eh, would it make sense for us to do it at the VA Medical Center when you can go to Holyoke Medical Center or you can go down to Bay State, mm -hmm. you know, or you could go to another facility in our area and we don't have to pay providers at the VA to do that, right? You can go, you can go to the local um, medical center, medical hospital, and get that procedure done. Right. Um, right. There's plenty of examples where you, I, I think you and I both have used yep. care in the community, um, directed Just by last the VA. Week myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you know, so this all comes to, so w w the VA looking at, the, they were told, okay, the, the VA medical center directors at each facility were told, okay, to get your leadership teams together and look at your assets and right. your infrastructure. Right. What do you do well? What do you do not so well? And look at your budget and where are the efficiencies that you can affect because it, by law, we have to provide recommendations to, to Congress, right. ultimately to the president. Um, so this past March, that's what's been in the news, this uh, asset and infrastructure review, which culminated in a uh, series of recommendations all across the country. So here, um, where we live here in, in Western Mass, uh, those recommendations were um, to shift um, many things to the community or to other VA facilities. <clears throat> the biggest one, of course, would be the closure of the VA Medical Center in Leeds. Um, what they would do is, per the report, would be they would shift uh, what what we know is the community living center, which is a nursing home for veterans, right. skilled nursing for for veterans with uh, long term care needs, and that would be shifted to the Newington Medical Center down in Connecticut. Right. Um, they would shift um, what's known as a residential rehabilitation treatment program, also down to Newington, and you know th those are veterans that have very acute needs and, yep. and that need to be, tr you know, um, have a level of social services and programs, uh, vocational rehabilitation, uh, might, might involve some, some level of counseling treatment programs up to include substance use disorders, other mental health conditions that they need help with. Um, a pretty intensive amount of, of work and effort that is, that is done for these veterans. That would be shifted down to Newington, Connecticut. Um, other things, so, okay, so look at what else is up in Leeds and, and what, what you most intimately are familiar with, Steve, over the many years with helping veterans come up to the, in fact, I, I know for a fact you've, you've taken veterans up to Leeds right. to make that, um, that warm handoff and to make sure they're getting the attention they've, they've earned and deserve with the VA folks up there. Mental health, right? Yeah. So they have inpatient, um, psychiatric care services. They have a nationally recognized post-traumatic stress unit. Um, we can talk at length about that oh, program yeah. and how over the years, how incredible that program's been. Um, and they've got one of the first 
women veterans program that's right in the country started right up that's there right. in Leeds. That's right. And uh, yep. Yeah. So they have they have those programs and all of that would be shifted Oof. over to the strategic collaboration that they talk about. And if it's not, so they do preface in the report, and it's, you know, again, this is gonna be a long process. Yeah. They do preface in the report that if they can't find a strategic collaboration, then they're not gonna, they're not gonna close those programs in Leeds, presumably. Um, other things that, you know, you never can take this stuff for granted. Um, and you talked about the veteran up in Cummington and the travel distance and, and transportation and all that, and for especially in our area, which you know it doesn't take take many miles to go from where we sit here in Northampton to be in very rural area in the exactly. hill towns, right? Yeah. So things that you know we can't take for granted: the specialized care, um, urgent care, you know, um, things in the middle of the night that you need help with and outpatient mental health where does that go well what the va says is that there there is space available in the community uh i'm not so sure about that <laughs> I, and, and it was so funny when so that that official announcement all came out in the report came out on that monday and i did um read some of it i mean it's long and it's thick but i i whipped through some of it and really read other parts of it but was really funny was the very next day they had on NPR, uh, New England Public Media basically yeah. uh, interviewed um, Bay State Medical and one of their chief um, uh, people in psychology. And they, they were talking about how they're building a new unit. And that was mentioned in the report. Right. It's going to be a 40 bed unit. And I was like, oh, OK. And the, then the guys. The interviewer said, um, but I thought you just said that there was a waiting list of currently in Western Massachusetts of need for 50 beds. Yep. And you're only building 40 and Providence closed theirs and this one closed that. And so how is that going to work? And he goes, oh, yeah, there's still a huge need. And I thought, OK, so we're talking on the civilian side. They still can't even meet that need. And now right. they're going to take our veterans and throw them in the mix. I don't know how they're going to do that. Right. Um, we're, right, right, right. It means our guys are going to be left on the side of the road. Uh, th yeah. That's the way so I th feel. So this right. is where we are now, where we're now grappling with the reality that you have this facility that for years has provided these services. And just as you said, S Steve, and I think that is where you're starting to get, you know, the, the, the critical analysis that absolutely needs to take place is, um, these these figures that they use are as of fiscal year 2019, so they're already now about going on three years. Old, right. Um, they talk about a declining veteran population. Um, they also recognize that there's going to be an increase in demand for um, urgent care services, for some specialty care, and also for most certainly for long-term care, which really concerns me. Um, you know, we, as, as you and I know, in working with, um, on the Holyoke Soldiers Home Coalition, with my background at the Soldiers Home, and you over the years working with your own family, plus right. going up to the Soldiers Home so many times, you know, there's a, such a huge need for geri geriatric psychiatry, geriatric psychology services. Right. Many of the veterans, as a as they age, a lot of things that, um, the trauma in their lives and and other things based on their military service come come to the fore as as they get older as they get towards end of life right they're looking for closure in their lives and the hospice and palliative care aspects of their care is much different yeah than um, our counterparts in the civilian community so when they start thinking about well you know we can take what is a 28 beds you know, 30 bed you, capacity right. for the VA Community Living Center, the nursing home in Leeds, and we can shift it down to Newington, Connecticut. That doesn't recognize everything that you just mentioned. Well, okay, so they're gonna build a new uh, Bay State, which is excellent, that yeah. much needed. It's very needed. A behavioral health facility, right. Lower Westfield Road down in Holyoke. But, but 
you know, it's not going to even become close to meeting the, the demand that's out there for, right. for mental health services. And then just what I've called the tsunami wave that's going to occur very soon. You can talk all day about declining numbers, but we know for a fact that the post 9-11 veterans will have more comorbidities and more chronic health care needs than any previous generations. And that's going to come at the same time when our Vietnam veterans are going to start Our approaching, aging. they're going to be right. in their 80s, and yep. they're going to need it. They're going right. to need the care that they earned. And right. what I think was most infuriating about this report, and you and I saw it last week at uh, the VFW Post in Florence, are these Vietnam veterans that have fought <laughs> their entire lives to get decent care. Right. And right. now they're at a point in their life where they absolutely need this care. Right. And the VA is saying, well, you know what, you know, we're going to send you down to Connecticut. Right. Or, you know, we'll see if we can find, we'll see if we can find you a, a, a spot Somebody, yeah. somewhere yeah. else in the community. Right. Yeah. And that, and that is hey, wrong. Yeah. That is hey, wrong. You're, and you're so right. Yeah. And, and what he's speaking of is um, last Wednesday, we had our congressman um jim mcgovern um asked my mayor and myself if we would organize a speak out so that we could um hear from veterans he really wanted to hear their stories and take that to the secretary of the va to the president to whoever would listen about how important it is up there one of the things that's always the va even has a magazine or a newsletter that i actually um get and it's all about rural veterans and how the VA is really trying to meet the need. You know, yeah, you're right. I have a veteran in Cummington. Now, we're not in Montana or Wyoming, but we still don't have and don't usually have access for long trips all over the place. I've had, I have several formerly homeless veterans who live in Amherst, and I try to explain to people, they don't have a car, they were homeless. We now have taken care of them. They're inside, but they still can take the bus from Amherst and get up to the VA to get appointments, to get their care or whatever. If you're gonna move them down to Springfield or who knows where else, how are they gonna get there? It, it takes you three hours to get to Springfield That's on a right. bus because you have transfers in Northampton that takes you an hour before you get the other bus. I mean, it, it, never mind coming from Worthington and Chesterfield and how those folks are going to get and the fact that and I love this one is that you know a lot of my veterans in the Hilltown say well I don't go into the city and I'm like well it's Northampton well I go to Leeds but I don't go downtown you got to pay for parking and it's all those people and now we're going to ask them to go to Springfield and then down right. to Hartford right, right. and West Haven and Boston it we're, we're really undermining what the, the promise was. And yeah, you're right. The hardest one is the Vietnam veteran because again, we all know our history. When they came home, I was a kid, but I watched neighbors, I watched friends of the family came home. They weren't appreciated. Uh, you know, not everyone was spit at or whatever, but they still weren't appreciated. And they fought for years and some of them just never would go. And then all of a sudden, with the new wars and the and especially that place up there really right. turned it around That's right. and became so inviting and finally Vietnam veterans were going up there and they were finally getting the care because right. they're retiring or you know they're getting older and things are changing their bodies are changing psychologically things change and they were going up there and now they're going to pull the rug on them yeah. that's the way it looks like for me who's not right. been in the administration of it whatever but that's just the way it feels like and that's the way it feels to them that's why the guy called me up in the Cummington he says what am I gonna do if they go right away? yeah and I think you know why this was so disheartening is because of the decades of work um, and the evolution over time into building a model that works up the VA you know you heard uh, and you've worked over the years with Soldier On as I have. And when you look at a housing first model right. and helping veterans, I mean, that that's the model there that, right. that people look to. Right. You have, um, they, they live in a, a wonderful, 
apartment. Right. They have There's access. There's 36 individual apartments and yeah. they've got their own space. It's their, they have their own it's space their and, it's, yeah. and it becomes a family. They yeah. rely on one another. They volunteer up there. It's a yeah. community. Yeah. And they have access to health care and they have access to the social services and they understand bro more broadly our community that we have here in the Pioneer Valley. So, mm -hmm. you know, they're comfortable with yeah. the community. They're comfortable with the transportation. It works. Yeah. And, and, and it works to the point where the VA has, has put in, you know, upwards now of $100 million into that facility to upgrade right. buildings. Yeah, that's the other thing they didn't pick up on. I mean, they said that it needed $125 million worth of repairs over whatever. Well, they've already they've spent already. $100 million. Right, right. Anybody who's been up there, and, and folks, if you're a veteran and you haven't been up in a while, just take a drive around. There's hardly any building that's been untouched at this point. Right, right They've right. all been rehabbed. Everything that was underground was tore up. There's all new piping in there. I mean, it's right, right up there. Yeah. yeah, and and we're going to make the argument. We're going to work really hard to make the argument with Congressman McGovern, hopefully Congressman Neal. We know our two senators have said support, and everyone wrote a letter and said they were supporting of it. That's right. But you know, it, they're building a new facility down in Springfield, anyways. Um, much needed. Right. Right. Absolutely much needed. Very much like it's what they did in Worcester. They're talking about doing the same thing at Fitchburg. They're already doing it in Leeds. They don't need to close it. What are they going to do That's after right. they close That's it? Right. I mean, it's not like they're going to have a garage sale, or if they do, that would be a tragedy. It, it's, and most importantly, like you said, the PTSD ward. That is, I've had guys come from Montana, Louisiana, Arizona, just to go to that program. It's that good. And it's one of the reasons I think it's that good beyond the staff, which is fabulous. And I graduated with high school with a guy who's mm -hmm. been working up there forever. And they're great people up there. But it's on a quiet, bare hill. Right. And if you want to go outside for lunch in the summertime, you sit down on a picnic table and you're hearing birds. You're not hearing sirens. You're not hearing traffic. You're not hearing people yelling and the stress that you're going to hear if you're in downtown Boston. That's right. right. That's right. You know, yeah. uh, or any many of the places. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, there's so many reasons. Yeah, it, you know, to me, it comes down to three things. You have um, a a residential uh, model that works, that has been a proven model to help veterans with chronic homelessness, mm -hmm. to have wraparound social services, and that's in Leeds. You have a nationally recognized post-traumatic stress unit that Vietnam veterans over time really built that program to where it is now. Right. And are, they're seeing post 9-11 veterans have for some time now and will, right. we God, God willing, for the f generations to come. Yeah. I'm very concerned about that. And then the third part is for veterans that just need, you know, <laughs> Any, any day of the week, we don't know what we're going to need for health care. Right. Many of us that have disabilities, you know, I, I rely totally on VA health care. So um, next week, I have to go down to West Haven because the, the care isn't available in Leeds. So it's a whole day. I'm yeah. retired. I can do it. And I have the means. Yeah. I have a vehicle. Right. But not everybody does. And if you're a veteran in one of the hill towns, you're adding exponentially the Some travel family and members transportation. Are going to have to drive them down to Leeds, make sure that they're on a van at 6:30 in the morning to get down to West Haven or out to Boston, That's right. where their appointment will be at 10 o'clock if they make it in time through the traffic. And we heard time after time last week guys going, and then you have to stay there till four o'clock until they pick you up and bring you back right. home, and your loved one comes and picks you up. By the time you get home, it's dinner time. By the time you get back to Chesterfield and you're exhausted for one appointment. Right, right. And yeah. and for, for things that perhaps are a little bit more routine, they're going to say, okay, hey, you know, there's a, 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 you know, a minute clinic or, or whatever. There's a provider right. downtown on right. King Street or somewhere else, a locale that's nearest to you. Go there, tell them, you, you know, you're enrolled in VA health care and they'll take care of you. 
not as easy and as simplistic right. as that sounds. Plus, uh, something that is near and dear to you and I, Steve, that we've worked very hard on is not every provider understands military service, understands um, you know, all the intricacies that have affected our well-being right. and our, our lives over the years. So to go in with someone just out of the blue that right. doesn't have the ability to really truly understand our history, it's it's going to be um, it's going to set set up again for failure. Right, and that's right. that's what I think all of us are concerned about. Right, and you know we 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 had that conversation. I know I'm running long, folks, and I hope you're able to hang in here. Um, I just think it's really important. But you know we were I was walking around with a microphone that evening, and at one point uh, I gave it to a gentleman. He was in his 80s and he was talking very passionately about his service and then the health concerns he had. And one of the speakers just popped. I mean, it just made this loud bang. And he immediately tensed up and went, what was that? And I, all I did was put my hand on his shoulder and say it was all right. But I had people comment and say, you knew right what to do. And I'm like, well, yeah, because he's a veteran. A noise like that is going to make you think something right. different than it might be to somebody else. That simplest little thing, so many providers don't know that. Right. And if they don't even know the person has military history, how would they know that? That's but right. we're in a room with a bunch of veterans. They all knew how to, they know how to take care of each other. They know what things might trigger them. The rest of the community That's just right. doesn't yeah, know it. Yeah, I mean, the VA, what the do, VA does exceptionally well is a coordination of care within the VA healthcare system. You know, they have, um, I mean, they, they pioneered the electronic medical record system, which right. is right. now, you know, they're looking to modernize it and they're going through their own. That's a huge, huge effort. And yeah. um, they've had a lot of issues at the, at the gate, right, yeah. to get that started. Um, but they have a system in place. Um, the interoperability between the VA and these outside systems isn't there. Right. So, you know, faxing records over and, you know, I've, <laughs> there's all sorts of memes out there about how that doesn't work. Right. The, right. You know, in some cases, the healthcare providers, and you, uh, the VA doesn't have the records to send to the, to the healthcare provider. So there's all these pitfalls that to assume that it's going to work yeah. Is well, it, just like in 2014 when they came up with the choice thing, they said, just implement it. It'll be fine. Right, right, right. It's it just, I, I served on an aircraft carrier. You can't turn those around <laughs> that's, yeah, absolutely, quickly. Absolutely, Steve. Right, yeah. right, right. And, and you that's can't do that thing. quick turn right. just like that. And that's we're talking true. the most, the largest, as you said, healthcare system there is. Right. It, it, it works, but you can't ask it to just change overnight. That's right. And... Just like when I started, it felt like Leeds was like the sleepy little place that employees were just up there to retire. And now it's a dynamic. That, that was the other thing I wanted to say is you were, you were talking about how the Vietnam veterans made that PTSD ward what it is today. And you're right. Very much like the female veterans have made that women's network program up there what it is. And it's one of the best. And... There yeah. was women up there testifying of what that means to them to actually have somebody say, wow, you're female and you're a veteran and you have unique issues, health issues, all the concerns. And they built that program and it is good. And it's, yeah, and they hear, it's better than know, to hear, they've gone. hear uh, the, the women veterans at uh, the listening session last week say that uh, if it wasn't for the provider mm -hmm. at the VA, I wouldn't be here today. Right. And the care, how, how great it's been, you know, the, the, um, the women's health care program they have in Leeds. Um, so what happens now? You know, you, the unique needs of these female veterans in their service to our country, you can't, you can't put a price tag on that. You know, it's, it's the, the upsetting thing is that when they come up with these recommendations, they base it on strictly on, on numbers, right. and the numbers aren't even accurate. So, yep. um, and as, as Senator, State Senator John Velas has said, we don't know what we don't know. Meaning, if you look at the world and you look at the daily headlines, it's a dangerous world out there. And um, who's to say 
next year or two years from now that we're not embroiled in whatever major conflict, right. of which there are plenty of <laughs> concept well, it, of operations that the, yeah. that the Department of Defense can pull off the shelf and say, we're going to war tomorrow with right. this adversary, right? right? We just and have to again, we don't have really selective service. We don't have a draft. Right. And <coughs> as we've talked about, the, the people who have served since 9-11 didn't just serve one year, you know, they didn't go to France or whatever and do their year, two years and come back. They didn't go to Vietnam the year they got drafted and they come back and they get on with their lives. All of the stuff that those veterans went through, we know, we've watched it, we've witnessed right. it. But we have people going back two, three. Actually, one of the women who was talking about the cancer she had at that speak out uh, went, the last time, I don't even know if it was the last time, I think it was the last time she came back from overseas. She had served in Iraq. Um, Mayor Higgins had sent me down with a, a, a plaque or whatever mm -hmm. to honor her. But her and her husband at that time had served six times overseas. And you're like, how do you do it and keep it together? Right, right, right. And of course now she has cancer. And you yeah, know, no. she lives here in Northampton. It, it's, you're yeah. not you're not going to serve any time in in these parts of the world and not come back um, the same. Right. That's this is the bottom line. You're going right. to need attention for the rest of your life. Right. You know, for if you're serving in these areas multiple times, like I said, Steve. I mean, there's Iraq Afghanistan veterans that have gone over close to a dozen. I think there's even some cases even more than a dozen times at one year or longer periods. Right. Um, so, you know, what we need to do as veterans, all the veterans that are watching tonight, is right. look at yourself, your, your own personal experience, your own journey that you've had in using VA healthcare, or those in your family, loved ones, aunts, uncles, parents, grandparents, and say, okay, you know, if this goes away, what's gonna be the impact? And, and may, or, may or may not have a lot of impact on you. Maybe you think you're relatively healthy, right? right. <laughs> Maybe you're okay. But no. for, for that brother and sister that you have in the community that needs help, do right. it for them. So you need yeah. to speak up. You need to you know, write a letter. You need to tell your story. You know, Representative McGovern told us last week, right? He said, I need your stories. Right. I need your stories. I'm going to accumulate all your stories, and I'm gonna make sure it gets to Secretary McDonough, the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, and I will go to President Biden if I have to. So we are very fortunate in our region that we have such strong support. You know, Congressman McGovern's behind it, Congressman Neal's behind it, all the st state senators and state representatives in our right. area, they're right. solidly behind us. So what, we, what can we do to help them? We have to tell them how the, what the impact's gonna be. Right. Um, that's we, we and and you have to be um, you have to be bold and you have to be forthcoming with what the what the consequences are. Can't take any of this for granted. Yeah. My fear, um, and I've heard it, working in the VA, I would hear from time to time people. I would say, well, you know what? We'll just get a give every veteran a card, yeah. right? And let let him or her decide where they want to go. And I bet you we could probably do it better on the outside than we can do in the VA. Are you kidding me? This right. is the VA healthcare system that pioneered some of the biggest advances in in the in, in the medical world. Um, does more research than any other entity. Trains more doctors and nurses than any other entity on the face of the earth. Right. And you think you're going to do it better and more cost efficiently on the private side? Right. It, right. It ain't gonna happen. Well, and, and, and Karen, the community, I mean, if you ask, and, and I know they've done surveys, there's been studies done, and any veteran that I've talked with who has used the VA, has enrolled and has used it, they don't wanna go into the community. They wanna be able to go to their place where they're comfortable to get their care. Are some of them forced to? Yeah, because they've limited what they have access to. Right. But, you know, and that's Congress playing games with the budget. But really, most all the veterans I deal with, they want to, their first choice is, I want it here. That's right. Like I say, I went to White River Junction. I don't mind if I have to go, but I have the means. 
But you take that place away, you're taking that away from a whole lot of veterans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and you're right. People and people spoke out and gave their stories. Some of them were very passionate and heart wrenching. Um, and yeah, people just have to keep doing yep. it. Now's the time to speak up. I mean, yep. where they're in that process now, where they're collecting all this data, and uh, ultimately this commission. I think the commission has until February next year, so it's not really a lot right. of time. And they still haven't picked the last member. No, of it. they I still know. they still haven't. No. I get. I think actually created their commission <laughs> yet. So they have a short amount of time to get all this data out. Right. And then um, there'll be a review, and it'll be a thumbs up or thumbs down. It'll be up to ultimately up to President Biden. But um, the best way that we can help ourselves is to speak up. Yeah. You know, um, we need to do that. So if you're out there, you gotta gotta talk to talk to your congressman and get the information over. Is there a strength, we, we, there we've is strength talked in really numbers. long on this. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I just I know we've talked long on this, and um, we haven't covered everything, um, but. It's just, it's really important to this area. And so I thank you so much for coming on. Just um, a quick wrap up. We're both on the Ohio Soldiers Home uh, Coalition. Um, you're retired, so you've been more involved. <laughs> um, but I've worked with you and, and all the other folks a lot recently. And um, we have two bills. We have the one from the Senate and one from the House. You and I and the coalition have our preferences on which one, which is the Senate one. Um, but, uh, you know, everything's kind of staying there. But, but the reality is, is we did win the argument with the building. We're getting a new building. Hallelujah for that. Um, right. Because they did get it in and the VA is contemplating the cost of that and boy, they better make sure if they're threatening us with the other thing, they better take care of yeah, that. Yeah, we desperately need it now yeah. more than ever now. Right. For right. sure. Um, anything big happening outside of... Uh, yeah, so you're right, Steve. Uh, you know, the, the big effort um, going into this calendar year was to make sure that um, the state had everything they needed for the bond bill. Bond bill was success successfully passed unanimously and... Um, you know, I think we're, we're waiting to see where it is on the VA priority list for funding because it's that 65-35% right. formula where the federal government picks up, you know, the 65%. So it's a great, it, it was absolutely necessary that, that the state did that and unanimously passed and the governor signed it. Um, but that's the brick and mortar piece, right. absolutely needed, but you need to have the right governance and oversight. Right. So that's been a long, I mean, we're going now two years, like you said, from the anniversary of the outbreak, uh, where m more than 80 plus veterans passed from COVID. Uh, you know, I'm hearing the numbers are even higher than that. Yeah. Um, to prevent that occurrence from happening, you need to have the right safeguards, and that includes the best governance and the best oversight. So um, with all the testimonies, inquiries, investigations, it's culminated into a legislative package, a House version and a Senate version. There's some similarities, but there's some distinct differences. Uh, a conference committee uh, was created from the House and Senate leadership, six members. Uh, one member is Senator Velas from Westfield. Um, and uh, we're hopeful as a coalition, we advocated for the Senate version. Why? Because it streamlines the chain of command. Right. If there's, you know, anything that was blatantly obvious from the investigations inquiries that the chain of command was so convoluted, no one knew who was in charge. You know, right. it was so unclear. And when something as um, overwhelmingly disastrous as a worldwide pandemic hits a long-term care facility, you have to absolutely know who's in charge right. and who's gonna raise the red flag and get help. Right. And that obviously didn't happen. Well, right, I mean, I mean they do, even within the administration, they were pointing at fingers. Well, I tried to get the National Guard. They wouldn't come. No, no, we don't. Uh, no, he didn't ask for the National Guard. I mean, you, you heard those arguments right. that, well, then who decides that? How, how come he says he did it and this one said they didn't do it and this one said? Yeah. So, and so, that's, this, that so the Senate version, that. you'll have the superintendent of the Soldiers Home in Holyoke reporting directly to the Secretary of Veterans Services who reports directly to the governor. 
they would remove the Executive Office of Health and Human Services from that chain. Right. The House version has um, keeps EOHHS, Health and Human Services, and puts in this additional layer of an Executive Office of um, Veterans Homes, homes and, and Housing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, just, it, it just perpetuates the problem that's been there. Um, so we really want to streamline chain of command. Uh, we want to make sure that the home is licensed as is any other long-term care facility in our state under the Department of Public Health. And, you know, <coughs> surveys, no notice surveys, all the regulatory requirements that come with running a nursing home, the same rules apply because they haven't. Right. So that's the other part. Um, and building in some community engagement so that um, the veteran community has a voice in that facility. So um, they'd have regional councils at each of the two homes and they would allow you know folks like yourself as part of the western mass veteran service office association to be able to have input and to also affect you know the hiring of the new superintendent to provide nominations so that right. that's also something we advocated for um you know other there's some some really good parts to this bill and make right. sure that we have an ombudsman position make sure you have an infection control specialist make sure you have an emergency preparedness position right. things that we know are absolutely necessary for a facility there uh, if we can get all that and a new facility the yeah. soldier's home is going to be well postured for future generations to come yeah. and now that we know what may happen with the va it's absolutely going to be critical yeah we need we need yeah. Need to have we need to have both. There's no yeah. question about it. We need both but, of them, uh, uh, and 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 it does feel like and <laughs> I, I tell that to my colleagues on the other side of the state. You know, you think we're all paranoid out here in Western Massachusetts that we don't get anything, but look what I've been fighting over for two years. You know, our soldiers' home, the one in Chelsea was without a problem. New home, all those plans were approved. There was money. You back in 2014 were asking for 13. We were talking about this stuff for a long time. We didn't right. get anything until we had a tragedy. Right. right. And then we're still fighting for two years for right. that stuff. So yeah, call us paranoid, but there's a reason. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think maybe perhaps to end on a positive note is what we found through this journey, um, what we can say, what came from an unmitigated total tr tragedy of of epic proportions it that really it's going to be was. hard. Yeah. Families are still grieving and will grieve for many years to come. Um, I guess the silver lining in all this is that it, um, it, it made the case that there is strength in numbers. When you can get together right. as a community and you could say, enough, this can never happen again. And when you speak up and you get together, and we do that well in the Pioneer Valley. Yeah, we do. Um, you. So, you know, with the VA in Leeds and with the Soldiers Home in Holyoke, um, if you're on the fence on any of this, right. you know, this, this is not the time to be on the fence. Right. You need to come out and show your support. Yeah. And, and, and I remember that first holding signs downtown Holyoke uh, at the bottom of Cherry Street, you know. Um, yeah. And, and it has been a lot of work. But, yes, it's on a positive note. It worked. I mean, right. we've gotten a lot of what yep. we needed, but you, you have to work for it. You really do. So, um, yeah, that, you and I could talk all day about this. Uh, I know we, we ran long today, folks. Hopefully you found it interesting. Um, I can tell you I'm going to have John back again in a later show down the road as things change for us. Um, but. That's the veteran world here in Western Massachusetts. We fight all the time, um, but like he said, we're not gonna get in unless you speak up. And also, if you're in need, remember, speak up to me. I'm here to help you. So uh, thank you everyone for listening, um, and we will talk to you all next month. Thanks very much.